Okay, thank you very much. That's nice. Um, <clears throat> my name's Rob Miles. Uh, that's, that's me. Uh, windows for the next I'm going to take a picture of this wall, because that's just awesome. I've not seen my name that big, like, ever. So, so there you go, you see there. That's me, that's fantastic. I also take a picture of the audience, uh, I be, and I take these pictures at the beginning, because that's when everybody's still smiling. So I'll, I'll do this part of the room, then I'll do this part of the room, and I'll do this part of the room, and I shall, I shall stitch them all together badly, and then whack them on the interwebs on 3w's.robmiles.com, which is actually the best website in the universe. Uh, <laughs> and I have done tests. I'm not just telling you any old rubbish. I have done tests. OK, so we're going to get from me. Well, um, about 50 minutes, but it'll seem a lot longer. Um, <laughs> These are the jokes, by the way. I don't feel obliged to laugh, but if you don't, I'll cry. Um, before I do anything too much, though, I want a, a bit of a few questions, a bit of calibration. How many folk here have written an application for Windows Phone? Okay. How many people here have got a Windows Phone? Okay. How many folk have actually heard of Windows Phone? <laughs> oh, that's good. How many folk are in DreamSpark? How many folk know what DreamSpark is? Same people. OK, that's, <laughs> that's not surprising. You should be in DreamSpark if you're a student. You absolutely should, because it's free stuff. And students like free stuff. Um, and students live off free stuff. Um, uh, and uh, so I'll mention all these things a bit later. But what I want to do in, in this session, oh, another few more questions. How many folk here have ever written a game? OK, how many folk want to write a game? Oh, that's, yeah, all right, okay, see if I can get that number up by the end. So, I'm going to tell you about Windows Phone X and A. I'm going to have a go at playing around with some ideas to build a game. And then I'm going to tell you how to publish it and how you can become rich uh, and famous like me. <laughs> or oh, maybe not like me, maybe like someone rich and famous. Uh, so, here we go. Quick overview of Windows Phone. Um, the actual platform itself is very good for games. Um, it even has support for 3D uh, using built-in graphics hardware. I'm not going to do anything in 3D because two reasons. One is 3D kind of hurts my head. <laughs> don't like 3D because it's got an X, a Y, and a Z, which is always tricky. Uh, and the second reason is that for a good phone game, you don't need 3D. Biggest selling game on mobile platform, probably Angry Birds. That's entirely 2D. Lots and lots of very, very popular Mass market games are all 2D. There are some 3D ones, but you can get an awful long way with, with 2D. And uh, uh, to be quite honest, <sighs> you could publish a game in Marketplace, and it probably won't become a world bestseller, and it probably won't make you rich. But it might get you that job that you wanted. I tell my students that, OK, your students, it's a great life, three years of fun. You can do what you like. You can basically, you're your own boss. You, you, there's nobody telling you what to do. You can do what you like, which is great. Uh, but for those three years, be thinking about brand management. Uh, the, one of the few things that we're sure about in this world is that jobs for life are gone. And effectively, you'll have to manage your brand through your life to make you as attractive as possible to potential employers. That's how it works, folks. That's the way the world is. So your student times should be an exercise in brand management. So when you go to that game studio for a job, and you're sitting in the interview, and the guy says, what have you done? You can say, well, I've got a few games in Windows Phone Marketplace. They're not doing great guns, but the reviews that I have had have been positive. Here you are, take a look, bang, and they're there. I've also got a blog about how I wrote those. Bang, that's out there. And I've been on these forums for a while, talking about rendering and speed up and game ideas and stuff. And that's, that's level one, that's pretty good. Level two, you go to the interview and the guy says, ah, you're Rob Miles. I've seen your blog. I reply to your posts. Uh, I, I know what you're about. And that's when you really are, when your brand is working for you. So do this. Get stuff out there. I'm not going to kid you by saying you can write a Windows phone game and earn a fortune, because I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. It might. 
because she'll have all the good ideas. Uh, I'm very old and uh, just keep rewriting things I've already seen. Um, you folk are going to have the novel stuff, and you're going to actually possibly have these things coming out of your head. That would be nice if it did. But you really should be working at taking part in stuff. Imagine Cup, another great platform to get your brand out there. Anything which helps you strut your stuff and makes you different from the other three guys sat next to you in the queue to go in for the interview. If you do it really well, get to level three, you won't go for the interview. They'll ring you up and say, hey, we've seen your stuff out there. You look pretty interesting to us. Come and see us. That's level three. Go for level three. Brand management, really important. Think of yourself as a personal brand and then push that out there. And I'm not really apologizing for this. It's just that's how the world is, folk. And you're going to have to sort of deal with that. It's just one of those things. That's my serious bit. Now we're going to move on. Uh, phone is good. XNA games, you can write those uh, quite easily. I'm going to show you a little bit about how to do these things. Uh, one thing about XNA, uh, it doesn't stand for anything. <laughs> it stands for XNA is not an acronym which is very sort of computer humor. <laughs> Not funny, apparently. Um, so, so you get everything you need, and it's all free. And I'll show you where the tools are in a minute or two. And you can target Windows PC, Xbox 360, and Windows Phone with a single application if you wish. And you can put three different projects in Visual Studio, and you can make your game from those. And then you can target those three platforms and push your stuff out there and make your brand even bigger if you want to do that. So you can write a single game engine, and away you go. Um, in terms of how the games work, well, games, first thing you see in the game is the loading screen. And then once the loading screen is finished and all the assets are inside the game, it then does two things as fast as it possibly can. It updates the game engine. It moves all the bullets, checks to see if they've hit anything. If they have, it starts changing the state of stuff. Or, or it reads the controls, moves the car on the track, checks for collisions, moves the opponent's cars, blah, blah, blah. That's the game engine. Second thing it does as fast as it can is render that. So there's a set, an, another process basically consuming the information in the engine and putting up a picture on the screen, which is what you see as a game player. Every game, Call of Duty, Ridge Racer, the whole lot, that's how they work. Okay? So in X and A, what that means as far as programming is concerned, oh, one final question. How many folk here are C-sharp developers? Okay. Uh, Java? Pascal? Algol 60? Ooh. Have you heard of Algo 60? It's 60 years old, nearly. <laughs> Scary times. Um, yeah, OK. If you're a, a Java developer, C Sharp's like Java with some nice bits added. OK, if you're a C Sharp developer, excellent. How many folk here use Visual Studio? Oh, lovely. OK, so I've got a nice. That's nice. OK, so we're all OK with the idea of, of classes and methods and stuff like that. And in X and A, there are four methods you have to know about. Uh, initialize, which sets everything up. Load content, which fetches your assets, that's your loading screen. Draw, which draws your game world. And update, which updates your game world when it's actually moving things around. And that's, that's it, people. That's all there is in the game. Nothing else. And uh, making a game, let's have a go. Let's, let's sort of, uh, when you make a brand new game in studio, what you make is a brand new project of game type. And this gives you an empty class. Uh, that one's called Game 1, and it contains the methods for draw, update, initialize, and load content. And I'll show you these in a second or two. Uh, it's all quite easy. Uh, we're going to start with a smudge, OK? Uh, I always start with something that's usually a fairly badly drawn asset. Uh, and here's the one I did in, in photo. It's just basically a smudge that's kind of transparent, and that's it. Um, if you've got friends, and you're a computer scientist, well done, no. Uh, <laughs> If you've got friends who are graphic designers and you're building a team, for the Imagine Cup, definitely. If you've got four people in the team, two really good coders, one really good presenter, and one really good graphic designer, that's the perfect Imagine Cup team because they can make your application look good. I don't know what it is they do, uh, but it's something that I can't do, as you can see. So uh, take the graphics seriously. I'm starting with a smudge. It could be anything. It could be a Space Invader. It could be a Pac-Man figure, could be whatever. I'm just starting with that because I can draw that really easily, and I guess you probably can too. So there you are. That's my asset. It's a PNG file. I'm going to use it to make a sprite. And my sprite will have three behaviors, one of which I'll, I'll uh, well, reset, put it back to where it was at the beginning of the game, draw it, pass it the game to be its part of, an update. So these are my three sprite behaviors. This is an interface, which is uh, 
C Sharp and Java both have these. It's basically a list of things a class can say it can do. And so this, whatever a sprite is, it can be reset. I can make it draw itself, which is where it puts up on the screen, and I can make it update itself. Okay, And that's pretty much all my sprite needs to be able to do. And uh, this is how you make sprites. I made a little constructor, and I can go off and get the asset, which is called smudge. It's a PNG file. It's a texture. So we go and get one. And this is my funky constructor, which I wrote. Now, one point I'm going to make, which is really important, I'm going to go quite fast. We only have 50 minutes, OK? But everything you see, all the code, all the examples, free download from robmiles.com. It'll be on there later on today. So if you don't quite get it now, don't worry. All the code you're going to see is up there. If you take it and make a million seller game with it, then well done. Uh, and can I have 10 percent, please? Uh, so let's make ourselves a sprite, which has got a particular texture, is placed at naught naught, is red, is a 20th the width of the screen, and is not rotated at all. It's effectively how I made it. Now, I've kind of future-proofed this. I haven't got any rotating sp sprites in my game. But if I wanted to put them in, this is how I do it. Now, you can unpick my code and dig through it and see how the constructor works. I'll, s I'll show you it in a second or two, because it's quite easy, really. This, folks, is the toughest side in the presentation. Uh, and it's really impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to build up my credibility here as a great programmer. Uh, and uh, it's a draw behavior for the sprite. Effectively, when you play with things like the phone, the phone has a graphics chip which does all the drawing. And what happens is that the processor in the phone takes a big pile of draw commands and pushes them over to the chip. The chip then renders them. That's fine. That's really good. That works a treat. Um, but the bigger the transaction, the more efficient. I don't want to send piecemeal commands. I want to batch them all up and send one lump of data across to the engine, which will then render it for me as fast as it can. And so sprite batch is a mechanism in XNA which lets you batch up drawing commands. And that's all I'm doing here. So I'm saying I want to draw with a texture and a position. Um, I'm going to draw the entire smudge. If you want to, you can pull individual parts out of your text. So you can zoom in on maps. Or you could have a single image that contains individual graphical animated frames that you're actually stepping through to make a, a walking sprite or a dancing sprite or whatever. Um, I'm taking the whole picture. I put a null in there. That's the color of the light to shine on the sprite, which is almost poetry, but there you go. Um, how much is rotating, the origin of the rotation, the scaling value, and whether I want it flipped or inverted. Um, again, don't worry, the code's all there for you. And uh, this, this code is just basically just going to draw a sprite for me, and you'll see the effect it has in a moment or two when I show you, show you a demo. The update method does nothing, because my first generation top-level sprite will not have any kind of game behaviors at all. What I'm building here is the root of a class hierarchy. The sprite will sit at the top. That'll have all the fundamental stuff. And then down below, I'll have moving sprites, growing sprites, bouncing sprites, attacking sprites, rocket sprites, you name it. I can make as many as I like. This is one way to make games. Works quite nicely. The method is virtual. Uh, in C-sharp terms, that means you can overload this. In Java, you express it slightly differently. But the principle is that I'm going to make child sprites that have different behaviors. And I'll show you a few as we go through the code. Okie dokie. So we have a very simple sprite engine, which doesn't do much. I want to make things a bit more interesting. I want to draw with these. OK, let's do that. Let's make a smudge um, drawing program and see where that takes us. OK, so C Sharp has a whole bunch of rather nice collection classes that come with it, one of which is called list. And this is basically going to be all the things on my playfield. And again, any kind of sprite-based game you want to make, any one of millions, this is how you do it. Okay? You have a playfield which contains a whole bunch of stuff that's doing things. Space invaders, you've got lots and lots of aliens, some bases, and a moving platform, and some missiles. Okay, Pac-Man, you have a maze, and then you have a little ghost that run through it. Uh, Angry Birds, you've got a whole bunch of house objects and some other bits and pieces that you draw, and you have physics in there to make them bounce realistically. Every, pretty much every 2D sprite game works like this. And this is my play field, and I'm going to have a whole list of these. And when I'm drawing them and working through them, I'll just use the for each, which is a, a way... 
You know about for loops? For loops can count through things. For each in C Sharp will iterate through a collection. So here I'm going to go, go through all my game sprites and make them draw themselves. So this is good object-oriented programming here, folks, because what I'm doing is I'm getting the actual sprites in charge of drawing itself, and it's also in charge of updating itself, so it can do whatever it needs to look pretty on the screen and behave during the game. Oh, okie dokie. So i got lots of sprites now. I could have loads of sprites. I want to draw with them. Okay, let's do that. First thing I want to say is, okay, the phone, this is, this is my phone. Very nice. It's a, no, it's a Lumia 800. Anyone got one of these? They are so nice. It's very nice. I used to have an iPhone. This is, when I started the iPhone up, I thought, ooh, I'm going to enjoy this. This is going to be fun. The iPhone was always a nice phone to have. Windows Phone has now reached that point. Uh, I reckon this is as nice as my iPhone used to be. I open it up and I go, oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy using this, and it ain't going to tip over or go wrong or misbehave. And I found it very solid, and it works a treat. And I've got, I've got a blue case for it, which might be that too. There you go. So there you go. Right. When you use a touchpad, you basically start up your game and say, OK, I'd like to get hold of tap events and drag events. And this is effectively telling the program, look, these are the things I want to see from the touchscreen, please. And it'll basically pass those back to me. So now in my, in my program, I can spin through saying, OK, if you've got some gestures for me, then I'll read it, and I'll then make a new sprite with my texture. I'll put it on the screen at the position of the gesture, so that's where the touch or the move event occurred, and I'll use red, and I'll make it a 20th of the width of the screen. And so every time we touch the screen, we're going to get a sprite coming up now, and it's time for our first demo. <laughs> so, nervous as steel. I never code in front of a live audience. Um, so here we go. This is all the code I've shown you. I'm using the free tool chain that you can download from crate.msdn.com. So away we go. And uh, this is the program coming in. And I can show you just because uh, you probably want to be convinced that I'm not to sort of. These are all my sprites in a region. There's my interface. There's my sprite. There's my draw that you've seen before. There's my constructor, which figures out a few little things to place it on the screen. Uh, I have a moving sprite here, of which more a little later. And then in my program, there's my update method coming up. And all that does is here, checks to see whether we're finishing the game. If we are, go home. If we're not, look for gestures and put the sprites on the screen. Run this up. And I'll just, for this one, I'll put it on the emulator, which is on the PC, so we can see it a bit more easily. Uh, fire it up, build it, deploy it. That's a fake version of my Nokia phone, which looks quite nice. It looks uh, quite realistic as well, which is good. And now I can draw on here, wee, and I can draw smudges, which is certainly not worth a round of applause, obviously. But to say it's about all I have written is about 15, 20 lines of code to do this. Ah, oh, that's quite sweet. So I can draw smudges, biggest dealers, fantastic. That's lovely. And the code all seems to work. Um, nice things about writing for the phone on Studio. I can put breakpoints in the code that I can hit inside the phone if I want. So if I'm debugging programs inside the phone, then basically I can single step through them, view variables, even change them using uh, um, the, the, the command window on here. So I can do all the kind of stuff that I would normally do on a desktop app in the phone if I want, which is really rather nice. Let's just stop that and go back to my presentation, if I can find it. That'll do. So we're drawing with some smudges. Well, big deal. Uh, I want to make it grow. Growing might be fun. We might have a bit of interest here. So I make a new version of the sprite. Again, this is C sharp. Uh, Java has a similar mechanism. Basically, I overload, I create a, a child class of sprite, which implements the iSprite interface, and I make it grow. And each time the update runs, my scale just gets bigger by 0.05. So that means that once the sprite's been created, it suddenly grows over time. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's OK. Let's have a look. Um, <laughs> so I draw, and the drawings get bigger. Mm, still not impressed. OK. I have a thing called, I call the wife test. <laughs> which is, which, no. <laughs> I show things to my wife, and if she goes, oh, that's quite cute, 
And I, I proceed. If she doesn't, then I'll move on to something else. Now, Mary's not into computers at all, um, which probably keeps me sane. Uh, but if I can impress her with something, I know that I'm kind of on the right track. So at the moment, nothing much, okay? Nothing doing. So let's make some random colors and make every single dot a different color, okay? So here I have a little bit of C sharp that makes a random color. We basically pick random numbers up to 255 for my red, green, and blue values. And then I basically make a color from those with no transparency, full, full intensity, full alpha. And each time I make a smudge, I'll make it a random color. And again, I'll show you this because I'm feeling brave. Uh, so let's try this one. Now, this is exactly the same code that you've seen with a new kind of sprite, which, draw, which grows when you draw it, and a new kind of way of drawing that gives me colored things. And again, I'll run this on Mr. Emmett because it's a little bit quicker. And down it goes. And so I've changed the, the background is now black. No, it's no, still, blue, still blue. OK, never mind. So if I now draw one here, wee. Now that, that, that quite, that's, that's quite, whoa, that's quite, that's quite hoopy. Uh, and uh, yeah, OK. Now, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and finally take over the world, which is interesting. Now, I have absolutely no idea how you could make a game from that, but it's pretty and it's a start. So we, we now, we've got some very, one of the things I want you to understand about computer games and this way of making them is that it doesn't take a lot of code to get some quite complicated and potentially interesting behaviors. And I showed Mary that, and she went, oh, that's quite cute. No idea what it's for, but it's quite cute. If it was a free download, and I could do that, and I could draw things, then I might quite like that. Oh, OK, so um, let's think about making that into a game. It's quite fun to steer it around. Uh, we haven't got a game yet. One thing I can do, because at the moment I have got no upper limit on the number of smudges I have on my screen, after a while, the phone is pretty good. But after a while, it runs out of puff, and it can't draw any more texture design. You saw it chugging a bit on there. Um, this is fairly horrid code, but it works. If I have more than a certain number of smudges in my list, get rid of the oldest one. And so now, as I draw well, at a certain length, the older ones will start disappearing. Now, there are games you could actually make using this, where you're guiding a snake-esque kind of thing around, trying to eat different colors. That would work. Um, and so that's one way you could travel. Um, I'll not show you that one, because I'm a little bit pushed for time. And you've got all the code. It, it's all in there. Um, because what I did next was I got, OK, it's not efficient code, that. I'm messing around with objects and creating and destroying them. But performance-wise, it seems fine. One of the things I tell my students at Hull is only worry about the performance of your program when it starts to run slowly, OK? And use a profiling tool to find out where the slow bits are and then actually target those specifically. Uh, and that seems to work quite well. And I thought just using a list and deleting objects would make work for the garbage man. And it probably does, but not in a way that I've noticed having played with it for a while. So I, I would quite happily ship with that. It's fine. And I'll show you why I'm happy a little bit later. So what we can do, we can add new sprites. We could make sprites that drift across the screen. We could make sprites that bounce off the edges. This is all very, very simple geometry. The game could produce these as well as drawing them. And so what I did then was I went, OK, this is my work in progress. This is kind of as far as I got. And I, I stopped actually doing this uh, to come and do this session. So don't, don't feel guilty. <laughs> but uh, I. I'm one of these idiots, that's the technical term. I'm one of these folk that programs for fun. I like coding, OK? I buy video games, but that's mainly for the, the joy of purchasing them, I think, because I'm quite happy to spend the evening messing around with code and seeing what I can do. And just to, just to sort of prove that we're not actually messing around here, I'm actually going to target the device this time and show you what it looks like on a, on a real platform. That's my Windows phone down there. So I'll open him up and just slide that away so that it's now open. Now I'm deploying the application to the phone now rather than to the emulator. The experience I get is exactly the same, except for the fact it's now running inside the device. So in a minute or two, there it goes, and my phone is now running my lovely little game. And I can do this, and it goes wee. And what I'm doing now, I'm drawing a snake, and every time I draw something, I'm also making some particles fly off it at random directions. So I'm into particle systems, and that's quite cute. Now, again, I've no idea how you can make a game from it, 
but I don't really care. And when I show Mary that, she'll go, oh, that's quite cute. What's it for? And, and I'll have to have a think and move on. Now, um, I've capped the number of particles at 1,000 on here. Um, and it's chugging a bit through the visualizer. But if you look at it actually on the, on the device, it's actually running fairly smoothly. Um, which I'm quite impressed about. So there you go. That's running on a real device, same code, starting from where we started from and just bouncing things around and looking kind of sweet. So there you go. So what could I do now? Well, I could strangle myself with the microphone cord. That would be good. No, I'll do that. Um, I could use the phone accelerometer to control the sprites. So if I tip it, the sprites go in different directions. That's easy to do. I could add images from the camera. Rather than smudges bouncing around, I could have pictures I've taken bounce around so you can view pictures and play with them and all kinds of stuff. I could animate them. I could make the sprites change over time. I could make them rotate. I could make a snake type game. I could make a missile command type game. I could get the signal from the camp from the microphone inside the phone and make these sprites dance in time with the music. It's all doable. It's just a question of a bit more code. And it's all maybe marketable. And one of the things I would say that's very important is do not be afraid to put stuff out in the marketplace and see whether people like it or not. One of the depressing things about uh, things like Marketplace and App Store and what have you with their review process is people can be unbelievably rude about stuff they got for nothing. They'll give a, they'll give a free game a lousy review, which I think is very unfair because they probably couldn't write one <laughs> themselves. Uh, and so why should they be mean? But don't be afraid to shove stuff out there and see what people think. Worst case, you can take it off the marketplace and all the reviews disappear. Uh, think of it as a way of building your brand and getting experience because that's quite good. The Americans do very well in life. And one of the reasons why they do this, I think, is they're not so scared of failure. A lot of Ameri big American successful people have actually had several bankruptcies and things behind them because they're not as afraid of looking silly or going wrong. We Brits are terribly scared of that apart from me, perhaps. Uh, uh, and, and so yeah, don't be afraid to put stuff out there and see what people think of it. Some of the daftest things I've created have been the ones that have had the best reaction in Marketplace, which is kind of interesting, and I'll mention those a little bit later. I'll talk about getting market ready. Um, and again, we've not got a lot of time. What you have got is these slides to look at later. So if you are thinking about publishing in Marketplace, you want to know how to do it, Follow through these slides. I'm going to go through them now fairly quickly. First thing I mention is performance and the analyzer, which is uh, on the debug menu of the Visual Studio. And that basically tells you where your program is doing bad stuff. Uh, and effectively, you fire this thing up. Uh, and it then runs your program with lots of instrumentation plugged in. And it works on the phone. And it works on the Emulator either will work. So here we go. This is me firing up Funky Camera, another one of my programs. What Funky Camera does is it takes your camera image and it funkifies it. Um, I'll show you very quickly what I mean by this because I have got it on the phone itself. So if I get my phone and I open it up and I go and find Funky Camera, which is in amongst the Fs, I do believe. There he is. This is a program. It's not, it's not in Marketplace yet. It's a work in progress. Um, on the left, you see the camera viewfinder. On the right, you see the funky version of the picture. And it's basically all it does is take the red, green, and blue values and, and uh, add numbers to them to make them wrap around and solarize the picture. It's as simple as that. That's Funky Camera. What Funky Camera does in terms of actually working on the program, this bit here is fairly quiet. That's when the camera is initializing. And then, pow, we start drawing stuff. And at this point, the CPU loading starts to rise a bit. And the frame rate starts to bounce up and down. It's doing pretty good, because it's going through every single pixel in the color image and changing the RGB values, and then redrawing that alongside the camera viewfinder. Uh, and it's doing that 30 times a second. So it works quite nicely. As you can see here, it hammers the processor a bit. My frame rate dips below 30 a little bit, but it ain't too bad. Uh, and my memory seems quite good. I allocate my frame buffers, and then, boof, 
kind of sit there at the same thing. So this is telling me that basically funky cameras market ready. If this number, if this thing here was going up and up and up and up and up, I'd think, okay, maybe I have a memory leak or I have to look at how I'm allocating my objects to tidy things up. But it's all good stuff. And down at the bottom, you can see there are hardly any garbage collection events. This thing's in seconds, so five seconds, seven seconds, 13 seconds. You can run it for as long as you like. And the way it works, it produces a big file of stuff you can then look at to dig through your problems. I'll not show you it because you've pretty much seen it already and I want to make sure that I finish on time because otherwise it all ends terribly. And I want to have time to tell you my favorite joke, which I'll tell you right at the end, so <laughs> keep waiting. Um, if you're shipping a program, you're shipping a zap file, and, and zap is basically a lump of data. If you're a Java programmer, you'll know about Java archives or jar files. If you're a C-sharp programmer, um, and shipping for phone, you put your program into a zap file, which is same as an archive, really. It's basically a lump of stuff and a manifest. And the way this works is uh, it is a zip file. You can look inside it. I'm not sure you'd want to, but I did. So that's my puzzle program. There's the app manifest. There's the Windows Mobile app manifest. And I'm mentioning these because you need to know where they are. App manifest is kind of boring and doesn't do much. There it is. Uh, Windows Mobile app manifest, that's more like it because this one tells me what I'm going to use in my application, has the capabilities in there. Now, when you ship a product, you might use the camera, you might use the audio, you might use the contacts, you might use the web browser, blah, blah, blah. You ask for those specifically, and then when the customer gets it, it says, this application uses the camera, is that OK? Or this application uses your location, is that OK? And this is where you tell the system, these are the requirements of my app. And by default, you get all of them, you knock out the ones that you don't need, and then you move on. And so having done that, I can put in some details, give the thing a name, funky camera, give it a type. This one's a Silverlight app. If you're writing Silverlight for the phone, you can do that as well as XNA. I tend to do both because I am that clever. <laughs> yeah, right, moving on. Uh, and then an author description and a publisher and you push all that stuff out there and away you go edit it in studio it's very easy to do uh, you just actually pop these things in there and then you've made yourself an icon this is another one of my f famous world famous games rob's red nose game which is a game involving red noses uh, and it's actually the most complex i've ever built uh, and it took me about two, two three weeks to make and i did the icons overnight which was stupid because they, they ain't, they're okay, but they ain't great. This is where your graphics designer comes in. You start making the game. You decide what it's going to be about. You put in a bunch of placeholder graphics, just any old pictures that'll do so you can get the gameplay sorted. At the same time, your graphics person is turning out all the nice looking artwork. And finally, you meet up, drop in the real graphics, and it looks stunning. And while the graphics person's been doing your game objects, they're also doing all your icon iconography, the things that appear in the start menu, the things that actually users will look at and go, that's quite nice, I might want to buy that. So please do your icons, get them done properly uh, by someone who knows about these things. I don't know much about graphic design. All I know is that I shouldn't try and do too much because I'm not very good at it. Okay, and so I keep my stuff simple because that way it, it doesn't totally get, go too badly. So you make these, put them in your project file, and away you go. And your zap file lives in your debug or release directory. Best use the release one, which you then push out and, and send away. So if you get deep into this, then dig through these slides and I'll tell you how to do it. There are some rules. You can't ship more than 20 megabyte applications over the air. That's down via 3G. 20 megabytes doesn't sound a lot. You can send 400 megabyte ones via Wi-Fi, okay? Or via the Zoom connection, which is another network connection you can use. Um, 400 megabytes doesn't sound a lot, but do remember that any application on the phone has access to all the memory inside the storage. So this one's got 16 gig of, of backing store, and programs can store things in areas inside that 16 gig. So your program could wake up, and it's a big game. So you could wake up and go, oh, I've not been run before. This is my first run. So I'll go online and pull down the assets, bang, and drop those in. So if you want to have more data in your game than 400 meg, then you can do that just by pulling it down yourself. Because remember, the code that runs in here has got 
proper web access, network access, all that kind of good stuff. If you want to find out more about this process, go and look at that document there on that link. That's all good, and away you go. Sharing them, yeah, I can give my zap files away. I, I, I can send the actual zap file, and a friend of mine, because I have friends as well, me, um, could download it into their phone, which has been unlocked, and run it. Uh, and they can play with it on their emulator as well. Either will work just fine. Uh, obfuscation is very important. My students at Hull tell me I obfuscate all my lectures. <laughs> Uh, um, not funny. Really. It, it means make this very hard to understand. If you push out some code with some very clever logic in there that's taken you ages to get right, if you ever play around with a tool called ILDASM or uh, any of the um, decompilers out there, taking programs to bits is very easy. So if you're shipping a program you're very proud of, I would look at obfuscating it first, changing all the variable names and having the logic uh, made hard to understand. There are programs that will do this. One of them is made by a firm called Preemptive. They used to have a very good deal for Windows Phone developers where they give it away at a very low price. There's still a free version you can make use of. And the other thing which the Preemptive Co. will do is it will add instrumentation. So you can go online and find out which parts of your application the users are doing the most with, which is very interesting. But it also lets you make code that people can't easily steal. And again, there's a link in the presentation for that, so, so by all means go down there and take a look. The marketplace is where you sell stuff. <laughs> there's news. <laughs> and it's the only way that consumers can get apps into their phone. This is basically the Apple App Store model, but done by Microsoft and called Marketplace. Okay? And uh, you write your applications, send them in for approval. If you're a developer, you can unlock your device for development, and the ones of you that are in DreamSpark uh, can become Marketplace members and unlock one device for testing on. Everyone else who's a student can join for free. If you have an Athens number, uh, which is a student resource for uh, libraries and things, you can use that to get in there, or university email account, whatever. But it all works. You should basically be in DreamSpark, because then you can publish apps for free. Quite a few of my students are doing that. And uh, everything happens at dreamspark.com or create.msdn.com. That's where uh, the people that pay tax, like me, have to go and sign up and do things and pay the money. Um, if you sell something, you get 70% of the money for yourself, which is nice. Um, and uh, uh, that's, people go, oh, isn't that taking a lot off? No, not really, because there's no other way. When, so here's the thing. When I was a student, okay, I learned to program on punch cards. And the best way I could build my brand was to print out Snoopy calendars on the line printer, okay? There was no way I could impress anyone other than my limited social circle with my line printer abilities, okay? You guys have got it so easy because you can put stuff out there that the whole world can get hold of, like that. You could put things in Marketplace, anyone around the world can get it. So the fact you've got that ability and this kind of system makes that possible is tremendously valuable. It's very nice and you're very lucky and I feel very jealous, but there you go. You can give out free applications or you can sell paid ones. Either will work. Um, the paid ones can have trial mode, so you can have a trial version of your game with just the first two levels and then customers can buy into the whole thing. You can put links in the game to take them to the Marketplace page so they can buy the full version. You can do all kinds of good stuff. You can publish up to 100 free apps and any number of charged ones or paid ones. That's the way the marketplace works. And uh, there's also a try before buy mode. So what I can do is I can put this tiny piece of code into my game. If info is trial, go get my license information. If I've got the trial options set, I'm running in trial mode. And uh, so at that point, we limit the functionality a little bit. So it's very easy to do that. You can also give away free, light versions. You can also fund your work by advertising, of which more in a minute. Submission's very easy, but you have to go through a validation process to make sure that the game or the application behaves itself doesn't try and take the phone over or, or, or do naughty things, um, and that all the assets are in the correct format. And so the interesting thing about this is they have a, a, a mechanical testing process where a program goes through your code and checks for naughty references, then a real live breathing human being will fire your game up and work on it. And if they find a mistake and they found them in mine, they actually send you an email or a report back 
with exactly what they did and how they broke it. And these people are pretty good because they found some mistakes that I've made in terms of how certain behaviors were supposed to be in the game. And they basically said, start the game, do this, do this, do this, press back, it goes to the wrong page, please fix this. So I did, went round again and Red Nose Game made it into the marketplace. So you get very good feedback on, on how, it, uh, how it all fits together, which is nice. You also have a thing called a test kit, which is part of Studio, and that lets you actually check to see whether or not your app conforms. And this is the first part of the test. Those are my icons for Red Nose Game and my screenshot. There are also some more automated tests, some monitored tests, and then a list of all the manual behaviors that the person testing your app will do. So you can test the app before you submit it using the same testing process that Microsoft use. And that's kind of cute, that's kind of nice. You can also send deep links to up to 100 of your personal <laughs> contacts to get a beta version of your game and install that on their device. So you can do closed betas of, of your program before you make it into a real one just by setting that option in the Thing. And you just basically push out a whole bunch of email addresses and then away they go. Cheese Lander, if you've not heard of Cheese Lander, it's legendary. You can buy it in Marketplace. It's, uh, it's, it's like, oh, I'll say no more. I might even show you it later if you get that lucky. Advertising, yep. If you don't want to sell your app, you can put adverts in it. There's an SDK plugin that lets you do this. One of our students is earning three pounds a day doing this with his game, which is actually pretty good. Now, you can go to Starbucks and have a latte. <laughs> Oh, that's my three pound today, <laughs> and away he goes. But uh, again, he's building his brand, he's selling product, he's making money, uh, and he's very happy about that. In fact, quite a few of the students at Hull have been doing this. Again, some more links you can follow to, to get to these places. If you want to go through these, th this deck a bit later, that's fine. Here are some good resources. Okay, um, These are some good XNA resources. Um, one of the things... Oh. Have I got? I can, I can show you Destruction Golf. You are lucky. Let's show you Destruction Golf. Uh, one of the things you can get if you're into high end, not high end, what am, who am I kidding? If you want to do more interesting things, uh, then I've just got time to show you Destruction Golf. We do a thing in our uh, department every semester, which is a 24 hour game development. We give the students an idea for a game. In fact, we have a thing called Three Thing Game now, where we give them three words and they have to go and make a game based on those three words and spend 24 hours in the department actually coding it up over a weekend. And the students love this, it's great fun. We started off, it came from an idea, we, we had two words, destruction, golf. Okay, and I said, those are your two words, make me a program that actually encapsulates destruction, golf, and off we went. And this is what I gave them to start with, okay? And it's gonna to deploy to the emulator, and here we are, and this uses a physics engine called Farseer, and immediately you can see why I need to have a graphic designer on my team, okay? <laughs> because it's a house, but not as we know it. Um, and I've got two, three objects in Farseer. I've got a shelf which is fixed, a house which is movable, and a ball which is at the moment fixed. Now, remember those gestures I was talking about with the touch panel? I can actually use, the, uh, there's a flick gesture which gives me a vector, and I can flick the ball, and I can hit the house and knock it off the thing, and I've missed, I've failed, that's not good. So I'll try again. The idea is to flick the, knock the object off the shelf, that's a good shot, and then land on that platform, the screen then pans to the right, and we have to hit the next one, the next one, the next one, and this is all done, oh no, that's not gonna go, oh, blast. Uh, it's failed, okay, uh, if I get really stupid, and fire the ball too far. I go, wee, right over the top, and finally, off into my texture. <laughs> and, the, and that's again. So this was the starting point. The students went nuts with this. For, uh, one of our students called Harry put a version of Destruction Golf in the marketplace. He built some levels using this engine. And he's done very He's had 10,000 downloads, which can't be bad, and some very good comments, and a lot of fun. And he's built his brand which is what he wanted to know. We've reset and back we come again. So that's, this is using an engine called the Farseer Physics Engine. And that sample code is out there. Go to destructiongolf.com. Uh, I buy domain names. Some folk have tattoos. Uh, <laughs> I have domain names, much cheaper and easier to remove if you don't like them afterwards. Um, so so uh, yeah, go take a look. It's all out there. It's all good. And that's the wrong, that's what you want. Oh gosh, where is it? 
Is it that one? No. Where is it? Come on, Robert. Use that thing between your ears. Oh, no. Not my nose again. Uh, now, <laughs> you can find out more about Farseer there. It's, it's a good resource. Um, if you want to make an Angry Birds clone, Farseer is a really good starting point. Okay? Um, although I'm not quite sure why you want to do that. But maybe. Um, if you want to make yourself um, a nicer place to work and, and work with your particular brand of phone, then you can put in your emulated skin switcher, which lets you do what I just did on mine. Little Watson's kind of good. What that does is effectively compile and email fault reports for you. If your phone tips over, if your game tips over, you want to do two things. You want to make the user feel better about this and find out what happened. So if you're building a mobile app for any platform, doesn't matter. If it goes wrong, write a log file. When the program starts up next time, if the log file's there, say to the user, terribly sorry, I seem to have crashed last time. Do you want to report this? And if they say yes on the phone, you can pre-populate an email message and then push that out to yourself. You will then get a stack trace that tells you where it went wrong, and you can email back the customer saying, I'm terribly sorry about that. There's a fix in version 2. Please download it, whatever. So have a process by which you can do that. If you want to do that in an XNA game, someone's written one for you called Little Watson, and that's the link for it. Uh, the second thing you should have in your game is a kill switch. If someone finds a horrendous bug that makes it impossible to play beyond a certain point, then it'll take you four or five days to get your application through Marketplace certification for the fix. And that's four or five days where you're usually playing your game and hating you. Okay? If you put a file out on the web somewhere, which your program checks when it starts up, then you could put a kill switch in there that puts things up like, I'm sorry, there's a bug in this at the moment, please bear with me, and stops the app or puts a warning out for the users, which is kind of nice. So think about that one. Again, whatever app you're making for a mobile device, don't care what platform, do those two things. Provide a way of dealing with faults and a way of handling massive bugs. I don't write software with bugs in it ever. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you're, you're young, you're learning, you might do, who knows. Other resources, uh, Bill Simpson's stuff is very good. And that's me, robmiles.com. I'm on Twitter as at Rob Miles and uh, um, well worth following, if only for the jokes. Okay. Um, very subtle bug, the plug, buy my book. It doesn't come with crayons. Some have said it needs to. <laughs> Thank you. If you're learning how to program, it's a good Introduction to Programming Using XNA, and there's a chapter at the end on phone development. If you can program already, there may be more advanced books might be worth looking at, but it's all there, uh, and uh, feel free to sort of have a look at that. And uh, where are we? Yes, make stuff and have fun. If I can leave you with a single message, really, it's that this stuff uh, lets you be really creative and get your name out there. And as students, those are the two things that you should be most concerned with doing at the start of your, basically, your, your working life. So please do that. It's a great place to do things and get things out there. Um, all this stuff will be out on robmars.com, including the audience picture, so you can check to see if you're there. <laughs> People do, I'm told. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's just really nice. Here are some links which you can follow. Again, the slide deck will be there to download. Don't bother trying to write these things down. Um, all I will say, though, is yeah, thank, thank you very much much for being a, a truly splendid audience. You're the best audience I've had today so far. Uh, uh, and uh, go out there and, and have fun. And, and, put, and my, my joke, the end, okay, right, okay. There's these three folks in the car, and the car breaks down, and the first guy says, I'm an engineer. It's probably a problem with the mechanical pistons or crankshaft. Second guy says, I'm a chemist. It'll be something to do with the fuel-air mixture not working correctly. And the third guy says, I'm a computer scientist. Let's all get out of the car and get back in and see if it works. <laughs> okay, and with that, thank you very much, and uh, keep smiling.